OK, so continuing on. Somebody the other day asked about uncertainties and what's, what's, the, what's the biggest uncertainty in what we do. So I, the biggest uncertainty when we've got pressure dependence is really making these empirical estimates of what delta E down parameter you use. Uh, in a best case scenario, we could probably guess them to within about a factor of one and a half. More realistic probably is a factor of two. So that, and, and more or less, uh, the uncertainty in delta E down is, the, is that as a factor is the same as the factor uncertainty in the rate estimate at low, in the low pressure regime. So sort of roughly proportional, rate constants are roughly proportional to delta E down. Right? So if you have a factor to uncertainty in delta E down, you have a factor to uncertainty in rate constants. Maybe this is a good point to stop and try and see if there's more questions. Does anybody want to ask questions about what we got to so far about doing master equations and thinking about pressure dependence in the physical picture? Mark. Okay. So, so his question is, uh, so if we don't have experiments to use for delta E down, what else can we do? And that's actually a, a, a very good question. What we're trying to do nowadays is start calculating it. So we can use trajectory simulations. You collide two things, see what happens. What, it, what They start with some energy, and they end up with some energy. What's the change in energy? Do that for a statistical distribution of initial conditions. You get some average values, you get some distributions. And we can then try and put those distributions in. We could go, go beyond the exponential down and, and so on. So Aaron Jasper is the leader in, in, in doing that. When he first did that, and I, I'm going to go into that in a little more detail, I think, in a, in, in a little bit. But when he first did that, he gets delta down values that are about twice as large as what you get from, from doing these empirical fits. Sounds like disaster. I'll let you think about what might be wrong. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. Does anybody think they might know what might be wrong? There's lots of possibilities. Nobody wants to take a guess? He does it with classical trajectory simulations. Is classical mechanics wrong? That would be something a lot of people would say first. I don't actually think that's the problem. The real problem appears to be the world is not constant energy only. It's constant energy and angular momentum. And angular momentum collisions do not automatically make complete redistributions in angular momentum. And so you've got a, some kind of a rate limiting uh, transfer of angular momentum. And, and that slows things down. So you end up with delta E down being too large, giving you too large a rate. But then you put in the proper bottlenecks for angular momentum as well. And you slow things back down, and things end up working correctly. So we'll come to that in a little bit. Here's some examples of just the fits to experiments, just so you see delta E down values typically increase with temperature. Um, different size systems, if you get to slightly larger systems, they tend to be slightly larger values. But there's very limited sets of data for doing this, especially in the high temperature regime. Low temperature, there's a, quite a bit more. One of the frustrations for a theoretician as we start to get to be more and more accurate. Suppose I can calculate something to 1% accuracy. Of course, I never can. But suppose I can. Then we have to take whatever we've calculated and squeeze it back into the formalism that, that people that do modeling are, are imposed on us for implementing those things. Right? And so for rate constants, uh, the temperature dependence, we have the modified Arrhenius form. That works pretty well oh, as long as you don't do too large a temperature range. And if you do too large a temperature range, they let us put in two modified Arrhenius's, and then you can really fit anything to within a percent, a few percent, tenth of a percent. Even. So temperature dependence, we're pretty happy with what you let us do. Pressure dependence, you guys don't let, the, the, the modelers don't let us do very much. They like, as the standard is this trough fitting. There's a few other approaches. But they're also got great limitations. 
And, 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 and an argument I'm trying to, to make these days, and I made this at the Combustion Symposium, is that we need to go beyond trough fitting. We, we're, we're doing better accuracy than what the trough fits force us to, to, to use. The trough fit has, uh, it's just some, uh, don't worry about trying to understand what's going on here. It's just some crazy form that, that Troy invented that, that works remarkably well. But remarkably well means you can fit things to within about 20%. If I can calculate things to better than 20%, then I find it frustrating that I have to then lose 20% in the fit. Now, probably I can't really calculate the better than 20%, but I'm still, if, if I've got 20% and it, as, as, a, as a goal that I'm trying to calculate it with, and I've got 20% as an accuracy, then I've increased my error, my uncertainties to 30%. So it, it's still frustrating. I'm, 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 I'm significantly in decreasing the accuracy of, of, of my representation. And it actually gets much worse than that as, as we go on further. But let's just first think about just a single trough fit. So there's this, this generic form, and there's, there's, there's uh, three parameters. At, at a single temperature, there's sort of three parameters, K0, K infinity, and this parameter F. F, in turn, it turns into this FC, and these Cs and P stars and Ns are all treated as constants that you don't vary. So we've got an F cent, a K infinity, and K0. So we're supposed to model all that pressure dependence with three parameters. And then we have to model the temperature variation of those with some particular forms. We have modified Arrhenius for K0 and K infinity. And then F cent has some crazy form that I don't know why it's like this, and I can never fit that, and it gives me trouble all the time. I don't know why we don't use a, a modified Arrhenius. But anyways, these, these, are, these are the rules for, for producing pressure dependence. As I said, typical error is 10 to 20%, and, and, and sometimes it's much worse even. Uh, it gets to be much worse in particular if you actually care about the low pressure limit. When you include tunneling, you only approach the low pressure limit very, very, very slowly, and that screws up your trough fits. But the reality is you don't really care about the low pressure limit in combustion. You care about fitting it over the sort of one tor to 100 atmosphere range. And the low pressure limit doesn't develop until, until say, 10 to the minus 5 tor. And so you just ignore the fact that you can't really do that and, and, and go on. But if you did care, you would, you would even much more method up. Some people have tried to develop advanced methods, but those, these haven't been put in code. So it doesn't matter if we can fit it better, because you can't put it in, into the modeling codes anyway. When we get to more complex systems in a little bit, the potential dependent, the pressure dependence has nothing to do with the trough form. You can't even get close to a model. You, you have things like uh, forms that have a maximum in the, in the rate versus pressure, or a minimum in the rate versus pressure. The trough form only has this um, uh, Lindemann-like form as, as its possibility. So you can't possibly use trough form for multiple channel reactions. Very many reactions are multiple channel. Yes? Yeah, I was just going to ask, like, uh, when you say multiple channel, um, well, you could have even, like, in the hydrogen oxygen system, there are multiple channels with pressure dependence. So you're saying that we shouldn't be using Troy fitting for those ones? Or, uh, OK. So he's asking, so even, even very simple sounding things like H plus O2 system are not really single channel reactions. And so can we not even use it for that? So, so H plus O2 is a little bit of a special case. You can use troroform for H plus O2, because the only pressure dependence is for H plus O2 goes to HO2. If you look at the H plus O2 goes to O plus OH, that channel has no pressure dependence. And so you get away with the troroform, even though you've basically got two channel things. It breaks into two separate uh, things. The, the, what happens is if you look at it from the reverse, O plus OH comes in and makes HO2. But O plus OH is so high and HO2 is so small that everything that makes HO2 from the O plus OH side either goes back to where it came from or goes on to H plus O2. Nothing can be stabilized. The dissociation rate from that complex is just much too high for any stabilization. So you have no pressure dependence for that channel. And that, that means up to 1,000 atmospheres or, or more even. And so then you only need to worry about the pressure dependence from the H plus O2 goes to HO2 side, and that's 
that's the standard single channel reaction. So, so, so you're all right. Another question. So his question is, there is another format that, that you're allowed to use in Chemkin. It's called Chebyshev polynomials. This is something that started with the Dean group, and, and Green group has used it more, too. And I don't think, know that I mentioned it here. There's a, there's a third alternative, log interpolations. The problem that I'm going to get to in, in, in a moment, I don't know how much I wrote down, but the problem with both of those two things, I, I, I haven't used Chebyshev, so I don't know. I imagine, I mean, you can, I think you can make it as accurate as you want. The problem is that the people that put these things into Chemkin, at least in the log interpolation, and I strongly believe in, in the Chebyshev as well, haven't let you do things right. They're fundamentally flawed. The fundamental flaw has to do with how they put, what, what you want to do is you want to have different expressions for different colliders, okay? Uh, the, the, the temperature dependence for argon as a collider is not necessarily the same as the temperature dependence for water as a collider. And there's good physical reasons why they wouldn't be the same. Uh, historically, what you have done with trophits is you just put in a constant collider efficiency. Water is much more effective, so you say it's 20 times the rate. Well, it's really uh, 20 times with a, some kind of temperature dependence. And well, they let you put that in, because you can put in different uh, Troer expressions for different ones, or different P-log expressions, and, and, and so on, different Chebyshev. But when you do that, their expressions go in the infinite pressure limit, the high pressure limit, to the sum of the high pressure limits. They haven't normalized things correctly in the high, for the high pressure limit. If you're just dealing with low pressure things, you're, you're all right. And H plus O2, mostly in the low pressure, I mean, so mostly it's all right. But in other cases, it, it definitely is not, and it creates trouble. And we've tried to convince them to change it, and we thought we did get them to change it. And actually, I think the current release of Chemkin has a new version of this that was supposed to be fixed. But we recently learned, like a month ago, that their fixed version is, is not fixed, or not properly fixed. There are simple fixes, but they're not, not made yet. So it's, it, it, it's one of those things that, and, and, and this is just one case. I, I haven't been talking about anything, but there's lots of, sort of sorts of things where, 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 where we need to have some back and forth between the people that do the modeling and the people that are, that are producing the parameters to improve the representations. Another classic case is thinking about transport properties. I think almost all the codes presume that you're going to use uh, linear combination rules to generate the transport properties for, for everything. Trans combination rules are by no means accurate. And, and we could calculate combination, you know, we could calculate collision parameter, transport parameters for, for basically everything without very much problem. But there's no point. Because you can't, you can't, can't put it in for anything other than your, your, your reference combination. So you, so you, and, and even then, and, and also many things force you to use Leonard Jones. Well, Leonard Jones isn't really the right representation. And I think that's less of a problem, but it, but it also is. So it, it's all sorts of, of things like this where, where we need to sort of move. I think we're ready to move one more step of accuracy in, in these simulations. All, 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 of the, all of the modeling programs, the standard modeling programs, I'm sorry, no, Kemkin, the standard one, was m written in the 70s. You can imagine, the comp and it was made to make sure you could compute things with computers that were available in the 70s. You can do a lot more now, in, and there's no reason to have a lot of the restrictions that, that are in there. So that's, I think, one of the things that, that hopefully will start changing. Another good example of, of a sort of problem like this is, is something that Mike Burke is working on, and that's trying to understand what happens when you have multiple colliders. I talked about how you have collider efficiencies. Well, really, uh, when, you, when, when you talk about things, all these, all these codes assume what you call a linear mixture rule. Linear mixture rule says that the rate constant for some kind of, of mixture is just the sum of the rate constants for the individual species times their mole fraction. Well, that's not right. 
you should put in the master equation and think about what happens when you've got all these different colliders going on at once and they give you different distributions and you can solve a master equation. And our master equation codes let us do this. And Mike Burke has taken our master equation code and, and done some calculations for different kinds of distributions of, of realistic things for this H plus O2 plus M system. And sure enough, there's big differences. Uh, I haven't reproduced, he came up with a nice formula, but you can't really put in those, put those formulae, I think, into, the, into Kempkin. So again, we're sort of stuck. He's shown us what we should do, but we're not quite ready to do that. One of the key things that you should start with, you should think about reduced pressure rather than, than, than absolute pressure. Reduced pressure is, is, is normalizing things by ratios of K0 and K infinity. All right. We, we have solutions to the mass equation that give us some trouble. Uh, low temperature, there's some trouble. Most of you are interested in low temperature. I'm not going to talk about that. High temperature, there's, there's other more interesting things for combustion. What happens when your Boltzmann distribution has significant population beyond the dissociation limit? Then, you, then you're going to be dissociating while you're forming this Boltzmann distribution. And you, you, you kind of have a, a mix of the, of the dissociation process with this energy relaxation process. And it, and it, and it, and it really complicates matters. The uh, people have talked a lot about something they call the non-equilibrium factor. We'll talk about it a little bit towards the end of the lecture. But this is, this is a, a nice measure of when you should be concerned about these sorts of things in a single well problem. It's got some analytic definition. Don't worry about it too much. But what, well, the point is that when it deviates from unity, it says that, it, that, that it, its deviation from unity is exactly the fraction of dissociation that happens before your distribution has relaxed to steady state. And so it's, it's, a, it's a measure of, of how much things are not are not well represented with rate equations. If, if things are, wrap, uh, dis, are happening while the relaxation is going on, then you can't model it with a standard kinetic phenomenology. That part that happens during the relaxation process is, is going to be dependent on what your initial conditions are, because the relaxation process is initial condition dependent. You've got all these other eigenvalues besides your, your dissociation eigenvalues that are determining things. And so you can't put those in, in standard rates times concentrations. And, and, and you just you can, you can take any particular initial condition and set up a system that will reproduce the time dependence. But then you, t you go to another different initial condition, and your rate equation won't, won't work. As you are simply in a case where rate descriptions are not applicable. That's something that, that, that many, many people have trouble understanding, and they, they, they keep talking about, about producing rate descriptions, but it, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So let's think about when this sort of thing is a problem. This non let's look at non-equilibrium factor, or let's start by looking at Boltzmann distributions. We're talking about when does the Boltzmann distribution extend into the, into the uh, dissociation energy range. This is for methane, and we look here as a function of temperature. It isn't until you get to about 3,500 Kelvin that you have any significant population beyond the dissociation threshold, which is zero on, on this scale. Not really much of a problem then. We don't do meth we don't do combustion at 3,500 Kelvin usually. The highest sorts of real temperatures I think are about 3,000 Kelvin, and even then it's usually only 2,000 Kelvin that's, that people mostly care about. Radicals are a whole other story. Essentially, every radical except this resonantly stabilized radical and methyl, and of course things like H and OH, will not will dissociate. We'll have a we'll have a Boltzmann distribution that extends into the, into the uh, above the dissociation threshold by about 1,000 Kelvin. What does that mean? Well, it, it means problems. And, and, and it's a problem that, that, that people have largely ignored. And we'll talk a little bit more about it as we go on to multiple well, multiple channel rate constants. But it's something that you should be aware of, that, that, that these Boltzmann distributions for, for, for radicals extend above their dissociation threshold by about 1,000 Kelvin is a common sort of thing. Here is an actual calculation of the non-equilibrium factors for some different things. I guess 
here for acetyl, we're seeing, as I said, about 1,000 Kelvin. I guess maybe a better statement is 1,500 Kelvin is mostly where the problem starts to rise for other, other radicals. Any deviation from unity implies that you're going to have some dissociation during the relaxation process. Okay, let's think quickly about the two-dimensional master equation. Well, now instead of solving for energy populations as a function of time, we, so, we, we solve for the energy and J resolve populations as a function of time. We have to have now a four-dimensional distribution. Start in some energy and angular momentum and start in some different energy and angular momentum. We have to have a rate constants that have angular momentum resolution. It makes the problem quite a bit more complicated. Still, as I talked about using trajectories to evaluate this. We can still do, run a bunch of trajectories, figure out what we've made changes in, in E and J. Our problem now is, is not so much in running trajectories and getting, these, getting numbers for, for different components of this. The problem comes in fitting it. We have to have a representation of this to put into the master equation. And so we try to make simple representations, but that's giving us a bit of a hang-up in trying to get those. Uh, before I get to our, 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 our efforts to try and do that from first principles, let, let's look at, 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 at a little bit at how, we've, how people do the reduction from 2D to 1D. The real world is, is 2D, but then when we actually do simulations, it's mostly in 1D. How do they do that? The standard thing to do is to assume that this distribution is separable into a, an energy part and then a thing that just depends on your final state. It doesn't depend on where you started. And this is essentially saying that you presume that your rotational distributions are going to be statistical all the time. And depending on how you do that, statistical can mean at the energy resolved level, the microcanonical level, which is better, or it can mean at the canonical level. And so there's different ways to do that. I think we're running behind. I don't want to spend too much time on this. But you see some differences here between just doing an energy model where, where, you, where you don't pay any attention at all to J and you just integrate over J all the time, and then trying to do what I just described there where we say that you have strong collider in J. And what happens is your distributions change right near the dissociation threshold. Which is, pretty, which is precisely the important region. What happens is, with this EJ model, you can properly take account of J-dependent thresholds that you can't take account of when you just integrate over all the Js. And so here you just get one threshold, zero. Here you get multiple thresholds, different thresholds for different Js. Different Js have different effective, if you hold J fixed, you have different effective barriers. Uh, this is showing that this makes some difference in the calculated rate. The, the, what Jim likes to call this a 2D master equation you know, because it starts with this approximation and within that approximation is solving the 2D ME. Uh, the other model uh, leads to higher numbers. It, the deviations are larger at low temperature. Combustion sorts of temperatures, the deviations are, are tend to be pretty small, 30%, 20% sorts of things. Uh, what's more interesting in my mind is that if you ignore tunneling, you get a totally different rate constant at low temperature. Not, and, that, and that extends up to quite a high temp temperature. I, but tunneling isn't really important at, at 1,500 Kelvin. So why, what, what is going on? I'm, I'm plotting here the low pressure limit. In the low pressure limit, we're assuming that everything get, that gets above the dissociation threshold dissociates. If you have tunneling going on, then your dissociation threshold is the endothermicity of the reaction. If you do not have tunneling, your dissociation threshold is the barrier height for the reaction. And so you have, in this case, I think it's about a 5 kK per mole difference in your, in your threshold. And so you have a Boltzmann factor in 5 kK that shows up in the difference between the low pressure limit rate constant. And that, and that doesn't matter, how, because you're talking about low pressure limit, you're going to pressures that are slow enough that tunneling is happening. It doesn't matter what the tunneling rate is. You have this dramatic change. And, and, and so what happens then also is that it can take very long, you have to go to very low pressures before you really reach the low pressure limit when you include tunneling. And that gives more problems for, for trophids. <laughs>
if you were to really try to reproduce things over a wide pressure range. All right, let's talk briefly about, about how we try to calculate the pressure dependence from first principles. So as I said, we, Aaron has this idea, you just run trajectory simulations. I guess this is for uh, collisions with N2. I don't, I don't know what this is. Oh, I guess, well, I don't know. It looks like it's the same as this, which is a carbon atom, but anyway. Let's take this as an N2. The N2 comes in and collides with the methane, and it comes off with a different, different energy. And we do enough collisions, and we get distributions of energy, and we can, we can mimic these. And Aaron did this together with Jim Miller for a few systems. It was, it was this methane system. And when you look at his, at his results, they look like they go nicely through the experimental data. And so at first, you're pretty happy. But then you say, oh, but you know, you're not really doing as good at counting states as you could. So let's count states better. He's doing uh, the evaluation of the density of states according to the rigid rotor harmonic oscillator model. Well, you know that anharmonicities can be of some significance, especially if you have as much energy as a dissociation threshold. When you go and try and calculate the proper density of states, that density of states is twice as large. Remember, the, the rate constant we showed was roughly proportional to the density of states of the dissociation. So if we've increased that by a factor of two, we've increased our rate constants by a factor of two. And so these rate constants, although they look good here, are, are because we're, they're, they're using a fake, not fake, but, but incorrect density of states. We're trying to move towards accuracy, in, and we try, we're trying to move accuracy from first principles. We've got to include those anharmonicity effects. That just screws up the agreement. You also, know, you also know when you look at his del T downs that he gets for all sorts of different things, they don't map into our del T downs that we got from empirical fit. And so it just tells you that there's something wrong. And it's this factor two sort of, sort of problem. So what we did was, as I said, we need to represent this four-dimensional distribution. What we do is we, we, we make a very crude approximation. We assume that we can, multiple, we, we can represent it as something that's like what we had before, a delta E down over some alpha. But now we let alpha be J dependent. We also let this be, be some, some kind of stretching so that it doesn't have to just be uh, a, a standard delta D exponential down. It might have some uh, variance in how the energy depends on it. And we also include a delta J down. And then these things uh, are not really energy and angular momentum. We allow our coordinate system of energy and angular momentum to rotate so we find the most separable version of energy and angular momentum. And with that, we're able to do pretty good fits of the moments of the, dist of the distribution. We aren't the first ones to try and do a 2D master equation, nor are we the first ones to look at this energy distribution, but we're the first ones to try and take this and couple it together and put it into doing a priori rate calculations from the master equation. When we do that, we get spectacular agreement for what we chose as our, as our, as our you know, model system, or systems for, for comparison. And we chose these systems first. They're a little bit of importance to combustion. Second, there's actually some good experimental data. Mike Pilling is one of the leading experimentalists in kinetics in the world. And he's done some nice experiments on methyl plus H recombination, varying pressure over a considerable range, varying temperature over a considerable range. We reproduce his data quantitatively. There's some minor discrepancies here and there. Maybe at most we're off by about 20% in, 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 from his data. We also looked at the vinyl system. And here what we're looking at is uh, both association and dissociation. Joe Michael at our lab had done some nice experimental measurements of the association process. Here we have extreme sensitivity to our barrier height. We're trying to do everything a priori, so we're not adjusting anything. We could easily have lowered our barrier height by a, a tenth of a kcal or so and, and, and improved this agreement. But even, even as it is, it's again 10, 20 percent sorts of agreement in our prediction of this full pressure dependence. We're not varying any parameters again. And this same model we use for both the association and dissociation process, the dissociation process, there's no indication of any discrepancy with experiments. We're within the error bars. Throughout. And these are just showing some sample trajectories, in indicating, illustrating Aaron's uh, 
simulations and, and what happens as you do things. Nothing particularly complicated. We started, and, and, and I'm frustrated that we haven't finished this, but it's just reality, we haven't finished it. Uh, looking at H plus O2, because uh, that's the most important system in combustion. Now we can imagine what you want to understand, you know, people doing all these, all these nice things like, oh, my words escape me, but, but trying to put HO2 in, in different uh, uh, things like increasing the CO2 or, or, or you, know, you always have, should be worrying about water. And, and so you should be worrying about different colliders. And we should be doing this at some good fundamental level with, 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 with moving beyond these stupid constant collider efficiency things. But the first thing to do is to start producing that data so that we can demand that they, they make it available. So we're trying to do that. Uh, TROA's group has done some very nice uh, measurements of these, of these things. And it's Cobos and, and, and Fernandez are, are his group. And you see that they go up to very high pressures. Uh, we see here a, a TROA fit to the data uh, of, 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 of his uh, model for this. Uh, red is, is, a, is a model from Jim Miller. Uh, who can tell which one of these is better? This black line is our a priori predictions from the 2D master equation, uh, getting remarkably good agreement. We're a little bit better in some places and, and, and a little bit worse in, in other places. But we're, there's no way to quantitatively, I mean, you could do some kind of uh, measure of the, of the least squares difference and try and pretend that you can tell the difference between which one is, is better or worse. But, but, but I, I haven't even done that because there's no point. They're, they're within visual, uh, all, all equally good representations of, of that data. Another th more important thing, that's 300 Kelvin, where you have lots of data. At higher temperatures, you don't tend to have so much data, and that data tends to be much more scattered. And this is just an attempt to show how well we can do as a function of, of temperature in comparison with experiment. Experiments are at, at a range of pressures, and they're sort of random pressures, so it's hard to c compare uh, very precisely. But there, we, we, what we've done is color-coded the experimental data according to the pressure range that it's closest to from our calculation. And what you see is if the agreement between the colored lines is pretty, uh, is reasonable, if the colored lines are, go through the colored points, then we have good agreement between theory and experiment. And that's a uh, pretty good indication we're doing pretty well in this simulation. This is for argon. We're trying to do other things. We've done a little bit with nitrogen. We're getting ourselves into some trouble. We started doing water, we got ourselves into even more trouble. As it just becomes hard to get representations of things. Yes. Just out of curiosity, how come uh, in the high temperature one, selenite was not laid over on top of the. So, so these here are only the experimental data, and these theory lines are only our current theory. I didn't plot TROA theory or Selavag theory in this plot. I'm just plotting our own predictions. And I'm just applying them for different pressures. And, and it would be interesting to, to compare Salavag and Troa and, and us to this. I haven't tried to compare them here. That would be something we would do. And here is, here is the, uh, our, our results for helium bath. We can do the same kind of thing and, and for, for nitrogen bath. This time we are just comparing to Salavag. I don't know why. These, these differences look small to you, I'm sure. They look small to me. People that model will probably tell me that these differences are actually quite dramatic. Because these differences, you know, 10, 15% or so, uh, there's extreme sensitivity to H plus O2 plus M. You change it by 15%, you change your, your observable by 15%. The sensitivity coefficients are one or, or higher in, in many flame speeds, et cetera. And so it's kind of an interesting dilemma. I don't believe our numbers are accurate to more than 10 or 15%. And so I can't tell you that I believe mine more than, than, the, than the attempt to reproduce experiment. 
but I can, but I but but I also don't think that the that the experimental data is accurate enough to to say that this attempt to fit the experimental data is is better. And furthermore, it's constrained to doing 1D master equations. Which so so you could say what we should do is we should go back to the 2D master equation and try to re use that fit to reproduce the experiment. But you're not going to get anywhere with that because there's error bars in these experiments, and so you 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 you're just wasting your time. more or less an unresolved dilemma. Question. Uh, out of curiosity, is there any spot that anyone has, like you had all that body of data collected and could, could like easily plot it out uh, for the, from Cobos, from uh, Troy and whatnot. Is there any spot that people, that's a good spot that gives access to people <coughs> with the collection of these data or do you have to go to each individual author to get there? All right, his question is, uh, so I had a plot of lots of data there it's tedious to collect that data and plot it. Is there, is there a, a better way to do that? So, so all I do is I go to Kinetics NIST and I go and collect the data, which is not a good way. That's all I, but that's the only way I know. I, I know there are repeated attempts to try and make it so that the data is all nicely available. People like Frank Lack and, and, uh, and Green was part of it and, and at Kaust there's Manny Sarathi is trying to collect data, and, and, and I think uh, Thomas Durani is trying to collect data. I haven't bothered to try and, and see how effective that is. Uh, but it's, it's a good question. The, 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 the long-term egotistical fake answer is, you know, in the end, we're just going to get theory that's perfect, and you don't need to bother collecting all of that <laughs> experimental data. <laughs> you don't need to bother comparing it. Yeah. We're not, we're, we're not anywhere near there. So now we want to get a little more complicated get to, to, to more common situations. The H plus O2 is a great reaction, really important study, but there are very few reactions that are just single channel reactions. And, 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 and we want to think about what happens for those and, and, and deal with those a little bit. So our, our generic, this is just a generic model for, for multiple well systems. We have just two wells. I'm just showing we can have transfers between them, we can have dissociation, we can go from reactants on to products, from dissociate to products, and, and each different thing can do things. The, the point is, we've got, it, 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 it's, it's not any, conceptually it's not any, any big change, right? We've got to model all the chemical processes, and we've got to model going up and down in energy. And to be precise, we need to model up and down in energy in total angular momentum. But we're not really yet at that point. Nobody's done a 2D master equation on a multiple well system, as far as I know. There's nothing technologically to stop you, but, but it just hasn't been done. That's one of our projects for the future. All right, so we just set up the, set up the, the, the master equation, and then we have to try and solve it. And where things get complicated is in, OK, so now we've got some populations versus time. That's what we got when we did the 1D master equation. The 1D master equation, there was 100 different methods for going from those solutions versus time to rate constants. When we started looking at multiple well master equations, nobody understood how to, to go there. Actually, as it turns out, Benjamin Whittem had told you some things. It's not quite right what he told you, but, but he had told us a lot of stuff, and everybody just ignored him. It was in the 70s. And, and everybody was just saying, oh, well, I've got these populations versus time. Let's try to somehow get rate constants from them. But we don't really know how to do that. Since that time, there's been sort of two approaches. All right. 
and, and one approach is something that, 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 let me back up. There's sort of two approaches to obtaining this probability versus time, to, to propagating things in time. One is what you call the stochastic approach, the stochastic model. John Barker is a primary proponent of that approach. And with that, in, in, when you do that, you set up a bunch of different simulations, some uh, of, of conditions, and you just sort of propagate forward in time according to some kind of random, with some kind of random uh, uh, steps of, of your populations. Uh, that process is, is quite time consuming. And so there's uh, lots of problems in terms of, of ease of looking at, at, at things for complex systems. But this is what, for, for reasons I don't understand, lots of people have, have gone on and followed more so than, than, than the approach that we prefer which is you can, it's still a linear equation. And so you can still use the eigen solutions, the eigenvectors, find, find, diagonalize your matrix and get, get eigen solutions. And you can uh, propagate things according to then just e to the minus lambda t times your, your, your initial projections. And, 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 and that's the, the approach we prefer. But, but these are both just finding p of t. And then the question becomes, what do we do with them? I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm still belaboring the, the, the master equation itself. Here's our, our generic description. I don't think I need to go through the math. It's just writing down the same equation we did for the one, D, for the one well master equation, but just now writing down that there's more channels. There's more channels you can dissociate to. There's, more, there's now these isomerizations. And you just plug, put those in and, and get some transition matrix again. Uh, there is one interesting point in the solution that, that I want to get to, that I want to mention before, before I go to the real solution. And that is, if you take the collisionless limit, you take the limit as, of, 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 of no collisions of your complexes. So, you've, so you come together as a bimolecular species, you form a complex, now, but now you've got no bath gas, in essence, and then you, can, then you can still be asking yourself, there might be 10 different product channels, and maybe some of your flux is coming back. You can try and calculate the probability of going to different channels, and you can try and calculate the rate constant. It turns out that's very easy to do. You don't have to, to do any kind of diagonalizations. What I've written here is, is a way to do it in, through just a single matrix inversion. This matrix inversion involves a matrix of rate constants that tell you transitions from one isomer to another. Uh, and, and when you do this, then you can easily include your energy and your angular momentum dependence, which is a nice feature. So you can understand how angular momentum affects things across the whole reaction. That only works nicely for this collisionless limit, unfortunately. But it is still an, a nice feature that you can do. More generally, as I said, we just get this linear master equation and we diagonalize it and then we represent things in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. It's worth thinking for a second how many of these there are. If we've got, say, 10 wells, and maybe for each well we've got 100 grid points in energy, then we have on the order of 1,000 dimension matrix that we're going to diagonalize. 1,000 is not nothing, but it's not, by today's computer standards, complicated. You can diagonalize 1,000 by 1,000 in a few seconds or something like that, especially if you use the parallel a parallel diagonalizer. Uh, the worst kind of problems we deal with are typically 10,000 by 10,000 when we're, when we're doing things efficiently and, 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 and wisely. So now we've got these populations versus time, and the question becomes what to do with them. The historical standard approach is, OK, if I look at populations versus time, Let's pretend I'm an experimentalist. If I've got some kind of exponential decay of some population, then that exponential decay should correlate to some kind of rate constant. And so I can just try and look for regions where my population decays exponentially and, 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 and look at where that population is going and try and get a rate constant. And when I started working on these things, my project assigned to me from Jim, it's a little bit not quite correct way of saying it, but the project we decided to, that we would start working on was propargyl plus propargyl. He was really interested in propargyl plus propargyl because in many senses, this is the most important reaction for soot formation. 
This is the, 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 the thing that, sh that most commonly shows up with highest uh, flux for forming benzene. And benzene is the precursor to all PAHs in some level. Uh, some special cases you'll have other things is most important, but most cases this is the most important. And here is our potential surface that we ended up developing for this system. There's, I think, 12 wells in this system. And so we've got a thousand or so dimension matrix we're diagonalizing. And, and the number of eigenvalues we have is a, a thousand or so eigenvalues. And we want to then populate the constant, propagate the concentration of each of these species and try and get exponential decays of them. When you try and do that, you find out that there are basically no good exponential decays. And all of your, whatever uh, temperature or pressure range you look at, whatever species you look at, there's, there's some kind of near, nearby eigenvalue to the one that you're interested in. And if you have two eigenvalues that are pretty close to each other, even if the, the second one is contributing only 1% to the, to the initial decay, but it, but it has 100 times larger eigenvalue, then it's going to increase your rate by a factor of two. And so there's, there's some problem of size and, 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 and coupling of eigenvalues. And you see that here. This is an attempt to find exponential decays for, for, for the benzene system that I just showed. We're starting here in, in a particular well, and I'm looking at the, the exponential variances for, for, for various for the time dependent variances for each one of these. I'm taking a local time derivative of these populations for a, a, a simulation that starts in well one. So I take the local time derivative of the second population. And what you see is as we go versus time, there is no, if, if this was properly decaying exponentially, these local time derivatives would just be just a constant. But they're not, they're not constants. Uh, there is sort of a constant range here from about 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 6. At short times, they're not, exponent, they're not constant because the relaxation process is happening at the same time. They're going up and down in energy. The equilibration of the, of the distributions is happening on this time scale. At long times, they're not constants because you go from one well to the next well to the next well, and so your, your, your population of this formation of the first well is polluted by its loss to go on to the second well. And so that screws up the, 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 the time, local time derivative. And so trying to do that just led us to throw up our hands and give up. And here is an, a plot of these eigenvalues versus temperature. There's about, I think there should be 12 eigenvalues or 13, something like that. And what you see is, as I said, you look here, there is lots of them. If you look within an order of magnitude, there's typically about five or more eigenvalues that are within the same order of magnitude. And when you then look at their interaction with each other, it's just a disaster. What I've shown here is shows only plots the lowest 12, and then it puts what we call, what was labeled here, continuum. A better word for this is a quasi-continuum. If you look at your eigenvalue spectrum, there's a whole bunch of eigenvalues, a small number, uh, correlates basically with the number of wells that correspond to the chemical processes. Chemical processes have a certain magnitude of eigenvalue. Energy relaxation, going up and down in energies, has a different sort of magnitude. Almost all of your 1,000 eigenvalues, remember we're talking about diagonalizing the matrix, it's 1,000 by 1,000. So we've got 1,000 eigenvalues. And 990 of them are up here in this quasi-continuum. The internal energy relaxation eigenvalues are all somewhere in the neighborhood of the collision rate. Maybe they're a factor of 10, 100 smaller than the collision rate, but they're sort of ranging from the collision rate down to, to, to some sort of lower bound. And they're all in this range. And so that's why we call it the quasi-continuum. There's a whole lot of them. We if we use a finer grid, we'll just get more eigenvalues in here. But do we care anything about those? No, those, those were the eigenvalues that determine what's going on here at early times before any chemistry is really happening. If you think about time scales, you, you break things into two time scales. One is the time scale of, of going up and down in energies through, to, through collisions, 
and then there's a time scale for making chemical transitions. We, we try, what we want to put into our simulations are, is models for the, for the chemical transformation. So to solve the problem, what we do is we say, oh, we're just going to forget about all everything that happens at early time. We're going to take our eigenvalue, our, our eigenvalue expansions and just say, forget about the, the, the early time, the, the large eigenvalues. Just throw them out and look only at the time propagations for the, for the, the chemical times, the, the longer times. And we can do that, and if we choose that properly, it turns out there's a nice one-to-one -one correspondence between your solutions in this chemically, chemical eigenvector space, we call it the chemically significant eigenvalues, eigenvector space, and the rate representation. Your rate representation has rates for all of these chemical processes. Well, imagine that. If you restrict yourself to the chemical space, you get something that maps into chemical rate equations one-to-one. -one. There's multiple different ways you can do it. We tried two different ways. I don't want to go through the math. You have some of it there. It's in papers. But basically, the key point is, instead of all of the eigenvalues, we look at now only m plus one of them, where m is our number of wells. We do that, then we get this one-to-one -one correspondence. We, as I said, we can do it two different ways. We can take it one method, another method. We get analytic expressions. And now we don't have to worry about trying to, to do any kind of fake exponential decays. It was just simply a one-to-one -one correspondence between rate constants and eigenvalues. And that, that solves all sorts of problems for us. It also tells you a lot about what's going on and about when you can and can't model things with rate descriptions. If you find that your eigenvalues that are, should be chemical eigenvalues have become as large as your in energy relaxation eigenvalues, then you can't really describe things as chemical rate processes. Because once your eigenvalue gets into that energy, energy relaxation space, you've got all sorts of mixing of things again, and, 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 and you get in initial condition dependence. You can think of it, you can probably understand that most easily by thinking about an isomerization. Think about cis hoco and trans hoco, or really any cis and trans species, but this is, these are ones that are relevant to combustion. There's some kind of a, a minimum on your potential surface for the cis species, and there's a separate minimum for the trans species. And at low temperature, you can think about cis and trans as different species. If you think about the chemical rate to go back and forth between them, it's not too large. And you can imagine writing a, a rate equation that takes you from cis to trans and vice versa. But now as you raise your temperature, your rate of isomerization between these two gets to be much larger. And it start, you start to go back and forth before there's any collisions. And then the process of, of, of populating your distributions gets intertwined with the process of isomerization. And then you can't, you can't imagine actually separating cis and trans in a bottle. You can't write rate, pro, rate descriptions for things because you can't really separate them. There's a merging of the cis and trans species. And so what you should do when you do your master equation, instead of putting in two separate species, you should just put in one, hoko. And so you should have some kind of transition between two species and one species. And if you really want to do kinetics well, that's what you should do. Of course, you can't do that in, in, a, in a chemical simulation. You can't change your number of species with temperature. And so you have to make judicious assumptions about which ones you're going to treat as species and which ones you aren't. Uh, there's real problems with that. What ends up happening is what you really need to do is do a lot of extrapolation of rates into, into regions where they don't really be, exist and so on. But it gets to be very complicated. The master equation, our master equation codes tell us exactly where you have problems and tells you where you should think harder about the, the, those kind of issues. But it's an ongoing uh, problem to try and think about how to do such things most accurately. I'm showing here an eigenvalue spectrum for ethyl plus O2. Here I'm showing in blue the quasi-continuum, or the first 10 eigenvalues of the quasi-continuum. 
There are another few hundred more between this blue line and the red line. The red line is the collision rate. All the quasi-continuum is between the collision rate and these blue lines. I'm just showing you the first 10 so you can see how these three black lines, which are chemically significant eigenvectors, go into the quasi-continuum, how they interact with the quasi-continuum. This first one is the eigenvalue that describes the isomerization of this CH2, CH2 hydroperoxide van der Waals complex and dissociating into ethylene equilateral. That has already gone into the continuum by about 300 Kelvin. It doesn't make any sense to think about a van der Waals species in, in combustion as a real species. All right? That's all that's telling you. Fine, we're, we're, we're okay with that. We're happy to just leave that out in our mechanisms. It doesn't give us any real trouble. The next one is this is the eigenvalue for the QOH species. All right? it's, the, it's the QOH species dissociating and, uh, and or coming over to this RO2. I think it's actually for it to dissociate in this particular case. That goes into the continuum right here at about 1,000 Kelvin. That's really frustrating. 1,000 Kelvin is just the kind of temperature we would still like to be thinking about RO2 to QOH chemistry. 1,000 Kelvin is actually a little higher than it is for some other cases. Some other cases, it's more like 800 or even 600. What then do we do? All right. And then this last one is the one for the RO2 equilibrating with reactants and products. That happens at about 1,400 Kelvin. That's okay because we're not really so interested in RO2 QOH chemistry beyond that temperature. And all this is saying is that we just go directly through this to our uh, HO2 plus alkenes at that temperature. And you shouldn't even bother thinking about an RO2 species. At that temperature, your dissociation is just faster and, and, and you can just sort of bypass the, the RO2 well. And that's sort of, but this one is, is, is really problematic for us. The, the, the thing that you can do, so, so if, if I was to plot our calculated rate constant, I would be able to calculate a rate constant up to 1,000 Kelvin, and then my calculation just says I can't, I can't do it anymore. There are no more rate constants. What it will tell you is the rate constant for RO2. So, so my RO2 goes to, to products rate constant. Will now include, as a, if I go at, at a higher temperature, my RO2 to product rate constant will include a component of going through the QOH. And so what I have to do is try to analytically continue my separate species and make it so that the combination of the two keeps going through things. And I, and I should now think about my QOH concentrations as basically being equilibrated with my RO2 concentration. So, so now, I, at, at higher temperatures, I basically have uh, uh, an RO2 plus O2 that will be equal, that will have a rate that's equal to the, the ratio of the equilibrium QOH and RO2 concentrations times the QOH plus O2 rate coefficient that you might predict. Uh, that all sounds complicated, I'm sure. You, to, to really dig into it, you have to read some, some things. But, but, but the basic point is you, you have to make some kind of equilibration approximations that, that, that are justified because the point is that you're, going, you're doing things rapidly at the same rate as, as the IARE. I think I'm going to skip these merging things. Here's another example, xyl decomposition. Here we have 20 wells, and you see the same kind of problem. And what you have to do is sort of pick, pick your temperature ranges that you're interested in and, 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 and deal with it that way. Our master equation code I've been talking about is MESS. This is available at the same website that I put on some slide earlier, TCG, CSEANL.gov. The big advance in this code is that and from what we've been talking about so far today, is that it automates this whole reduction process. As it does it, and so it produces the proper rate constants and only the proper rate constants 
It also has lots of these features we talked about yesterday, like multidimensional torsions and so on. Yuri Georgievsky is the, the, the writer of this code. He, he had a new formalism for doing it, but it all boils down to exactly the same results. Uh, we have phenyl plus acetylene example here. This, this example shows you a little bit of, of, of the troubles. If you think about Hakka mechanisms, Hakka mechanisms take you through complexes such as this. Uh, but if you look at these, com these complexes, they are not kinetically stable at the temperatures of relevance to Hakka. By 1500 Kelvin, these species don't exist as species. You're dissociating forwards or backwards more rapidly then you can be stabilized. So it makes no sense to have a C8H7 species in your mechanism at 1500 Kelvin. You see that here on this next plot. These are the, the rate constants. Where these rate constants stop is because the species that they're, that they're going to has become kinetically unstable. And so uh, uh, the well one and three combination is unstable at just below 1500 Kelvin. Uh, the the uh, well three species, I think it is, whichever, yeah, I forget which one it is. I guess it's the well three species becomes unstable already at about 1100 Kelvin. And what happens here is beyond this point, then you get a merging of the, of the thing. So, you're re so if I'm looking at these rate constants and go from R1 onwards, I don't have rates to individual species, I have a rate to the combination of the species, and I also have the, the rate from, to go on to the products, uh, only really simply defined up to this point. And then at, at higher temperatures, you get a combination of all three. And so this green line is the combination of these two, and this blue line was the combination of, of these two. And that's the kind of thing that you have to do if you're going to properly think about about kinetics. But at, at 1500 and higher, which is basically where you're interested in Hakka, there is no whale. You should be thinking about your dynamics as being direct. You go directly from here to, our, to these bimolecular products, nothing else. You can't have, you can't have additions to these things because they don't stay, they don't stick around long enough to, be, to exist as kinetic species. That creates certain problems. So here, here are some master equation codes that are available. And I'll stop, stop here, and we'll start up again in 15 minutes, 3.40, I guess. <laughs>